a uh, few things before we start. Just I, I, I'll remind you that, that, that the first midterm exam is coming up a uh, week from Monday, I believe it is. No, a week from, it's Monday, right? It's, it's, it's the 26th, whatever the day the 26th is. So I encourage you to, to take the old exams uh, as preparation for that. You'll see what kind of questions I ask and so on. It has come up that, that if, you're a UV, if you're at a virginia.edu IP address, you can simply go in and look at the old exams. If you're not, you, you'll get a little thing that says you have to come in through the password version of that site. And the password, I, I put a password on so that people from randomly around the internet can't go in and then look at my exams and, and then sprinkle them around the internet. Because there are other people, people at other institutions use my, my exams in various ways. And I don't really want them just like wandering randomly around the internet. Therefore, from outside at Virginia IP, EDU IP address, you have to go in with a username and password. And the username and password, I'm going to turn off my, my microphone for a second. include the password in the email when I send out uh, problem set three, which I also owe you. Uh, I'll, I'll remind you of that password and uh, username. Any other questions about the exam coming up? Ah, what it'll cover? Is that, Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I was donating my two like, old midterms and stuff. Yep. So, so it's basically, what does the first midterm cover? And the first midterm <laughs> covers will cover the first three chapters of the book, which goes up through roller coasters and uh, carousels. Assuming I get there, if I don't manage to get to roller coasters and carousels properly by, by before the exam, I'll, I'll, I'll truncate what I'll cover. Um, midterm two is you will, if you go look in the old midterms two, you'll see a lot of questions that are that are in our future, but you'll also see me revisiting questions from these first chapters for several reasons. One of them is, is that it's, everything's cumulative, uh, finally, and therefore it's sometimes hard to tell exactly where, where in the material a particular question comes from, because it's sort of across, a, a, you know, acceleration is going to keep showing up. And its context eh, may be changing, but, it, but it'll still be there. The other thing is that I, that I do tend to, to uh, go and ask you questions particularly on things that, that people did poorly on in the first midterm, uh, to see whether they're, they're, they've uh, worked on it. So I'll ask you the same. In, you, you'll see in the midterms, too, sometimes I ask exactly the same question for midterm one, and people still get it wrong. So you know, who knew? Other questions? OK. So then trying to, to get back to the topic uh, that we're doing and, and make progress with it, spring scales. So, Spring scales, the purpose of a spring scale is, is, is to figure out how much of something there is. That is, uh, you, you, whether you're weighing groceries at the, at the store, whether you're weighing yourself, a truck trying to figure out how much it's carrying, all that stuff. They're trying to, to, to measure a, you know, an amount of something. And actually, that brings up sort of the two possibilities for quantifying stuff, you, bag of carrots and stuff. You really have a choice between measuring weight and measuring mass. And I could dwell on those for a while, but you, you, you now have, a, I hope, a sense that, that measuring weight is measuring how, much, how strongly gravity is pulling down on something. And it is, it is the case that two objects that, that differ in weight by a factor of two, really they, they, they really do differ in, in, in substance by a factor of two. It's, it, that's a perfectly valid way of, of making the measurement. If you want to compare sacks of carrots, the one that weighs twice as much really has sort of twice as much carrot in it. So that's perfectly good. However, measuring weight has a couple of challenges to it. One is you can't literally measure weight, because weight is the force that's acting on the carrots because of the Earth's gravity. And when you can ask the carrots to tell you how much they're being pulled down, they're not going to talk. So, I mean, unless it's some horrible uh, animated movie, or me talking for the carrots, which I do. 
The other thing is that if you, if you go to different locations, the strength of gravity varies. Not much, but enough so that the measurement of, of weight is a little iffy. You've got to adjust for the fact that gravity isn't the same everywhere. OK, so, so that's, uh, you, you've got to make it, The measurement of weight is an indirect measurement, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it's got to be, uh, you've got to compensate for variations in the strength of gravity. The alternative, which is this, this uh, so the, you know, the, the alternative measurement. So I've got two, two slides here for whatever, you know, for better or worse. Mass is a measurement. Mass is, a, is really a, an elegant thing to measure. It's, it's, it's the real quantification of how much of substance there is. And it is completely independent of where you are in the universe. If you have a sack of one kilogram, which is a, which is a unit of mass, one kilogram of carrots, that means that if you shake them, you'll feel that mass in its resistance to acceleration. It's the same here as if you go off into some distant star or deep space or wherever you like. It's the same. And uh, one kilogram is the amount of, of carrots for s that if you exert a one newton force on, those, on that one kilogram, you'll get one meter per second, per second acceleration out of it. Straight, you know, that's it. It's a direct measurement. You can do that measurement. You can push. You exert a one newton force on the on the sack. If it accelerates at one meter per second, bam! You've got a one meter per second squared. You've got a kilogram. Direct measurement. It's a tough measurement to make, and therefore, it's rare that people directly measure mass. It's it's just too challenging. Is that okay? Or questions about the idea of measuring mass as as a uh, a wonderfully universal quantifying, quantification of, of what you're working with. It has nothing to do with gravity. Weight, on the other hand, has everything to do with gravity. But because an object's weight is proportional to its mass, all the, the strength of gravity being kept constant. That is, do the, me do the measurements in the same location, measuring weights essentially as good as measuring mass. And you can do it more easily, and that's why we, we routinely do do it. We use, we use gravity to, make, to quantify stuff. All right? Any, any, any background questions at this point? Keep asking you for, to ask you questions. OK. So spring scales are going to measure weight. And the way that they do it is that the, a spring scale, when you want to go way, I don't have the bowling ball today. You, you want to weigh the weight of this thing. This is a five, it's a five kilogram object, which means that if I shake it and I really know exactly how hard I'm pushing and I can measure how much it's accelerating, I can determine, ah, it's five kilograms. But that's tough. So instead, I take advantage of the fact that gravity's pulling the sucker down with a force of about 49 newtons. Because 9.8 meters per second, uh, sorry, it exerts 9.8. Newtons for every kilogram. There are five kilograms. That's about 49. And the scale figures that out and tells us. Right? It's reading right here about 49. And the, the story today, then, is how did it pull off that stunt? How does it know that gravity is pulling down on this block with a force of 49 newtons? And it's a, it's a little more complicated. It's not as straightforward as I would like, but it is what it is. So here's the whole story, and I guess I can, I can put it together uh, pretty straightforward. Right now, the block is not accelerating. How do I know that? It's motionless, it's still motionless, it's still motionless. It's not picking up speed in any direction. So what's the net force acting on it right now? You tell me. Zero. No overall force. It is experienced, however, two individual forces that's that evidently sum to zero. One of them we know what it is. It's, we know by name. It's not by quantity. It's the downward pull of gravity. Okay, So that's one force. It's downward. And the other force is a force evidently coming from the scale, and it's upward. And it better exactly cancel the downward weight. The evidence for that is no acceleration. So. The scale is pushing up with a force equal in amount to the block's weight. It's, it's, a, it's adjusted to get that value. That this is not a Newton's third law pair. The block is experiencing two essentially 
independent forces that have nothing to do with Newton's third law. One of them is gravity down. That's the Earth pulling down on the block. The other is an upward push from the scale. The scale is pushing up on the block. Those two forces, gravity down, scale up, unrelated. They happen to match and cancel. But they don't always have to. In this case, they are. All right? Having said all that, then, there's only one thing left to do. To have the scale tell us how hard it's pushing. We know it's pushing up with a force that matches the block's weight. So scale, tell us, OK? How, how does it pull that off? It pulls it off because it's using a spring. And this is why it's the, the word spring and spring scale is why I got all these springs around here. Springs have this amazing characteristic that they have an equilibrium shape any given spring. This one's a, a coil spring. I told you last time that there are springs of all sorts of shapes. Uh, they tend to be, for good reason, to be, to have, to be one dimensional, to extend in one, along one axis, not several. And that has to do with getting the, this, this nice relationship to work properly. This is a, this is a spring too. It's a, it's a, you might call it a leaf spring or a, or a beam. Spring, but but it, again, it, it's one dimensional. It's along this direction only. The coil spring is along that direction only. The point point of this then is, these things have the characteristic that if you distort them away from the equilibrium shape, whatever it happens to be, they experience you know, a, a rest, what's called a restoring force. The end, the spring exerts on its own end a restoring force that pushes back towards equilibrium, and that restoring force is proportional to how far you've taken the springs and away from where, where it wanted to be. So just to just pick, I, I, I ended last time with this spring talking about the tip experiencing this so-called restoring force. And that if I push the tip down one inch, or let me, let me stick with metric units, otherwise I'll, I'll if, I, if I go down one centimeter, it pushes back with a force of one newton, say. If I bend it down a total of two centimeters, so twice as far, it pushes back with a restoring force of two newtons. Three centimeters, three newtons. If I go the other way, the whole proportionality continues to work, and everything's reversed. One centimeter up, you get one newton of restoring force back towards the equilibrium. The word restoring is it, suggesting it's going back trying to restore it to equilibrium. All right? This is, I could just jump ahead in my slides. It's like, cavalierly, don't use my own slides. Here, here's, it's called Hooke's Law. I'm gonna, I'll go back in a moment to the previous slide, because it has a, a point that's, that's useful. The op, it's just an observation. It's a very old observation. Robert Hooke was, gosh, he's like, 300 years ago, so give or take, made this observation that, that the, the force acting on the end of a spring is, first of all, it's exactly proportional for all, you know, to, 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 to a very, very good, uh, it's an approximation, but it's really good. It, uh, it's proportional to the distortion. And the negative sign that's in that, the point of that, what that's meaning is, is that it's, it's restoring. It pushes back toward equilibrium. So if you distort it to the right, it pushes back to the left. Um, and then the spring constant is the measure of the stiffness of a spring. It's telling you, for a given distortion, how much restoring force comes up. A really stiff spring has a big spring constant, so a little distortion gives you a huge restoring force. This, this for example, has a huge spring constant. You know, I probably can't shrink it by more than two or three centimeters, period. Okay. In contrast, well, some of these springs up here have very small spring constants. You can just stretch them and, and uh, whatever, not quite effortlessly, but pretty close. All right? So it's, it's, so this is a, the formulaic version of, of that, just the general con conceptual uh, observation that springs, they act in a restoring manner. They try to go back to equilibrium, and the farther you bend them, the, the harder they push back. Uh, to go back to the previous slide, the, the value of, of this slide from, from, from my perspective is that the equilibrium, it's the, it's, it's the second to last line that's in here, 
the equilibrium that something like this has, a spring has, right now it's at equilibrium, meaning that, it's, that the end is experiencing zero net force. It's what's, what's known as a stable equilibrium. What's a, what's a stable equilibrium? It's one that if you disturb this system away from equilibrium, say by pushing it down and let go, it, it forces a rise that push it back towards equilibrium. In this case, it's the spring force itself that pushes it back towards equilibrium. You notice it bounced. It, it overshot. That, that whole story, it, it does the bouncy trick. But stable equilibria, which are common in, in there are many systems that are stable equilibrium. Um, a, a ball, at the, a marble at the bottom of a round bowl. It keeps going back and forth. It's trying to settle in the bottom of the bowl. That's a stable equilibrium if it gets there. And stable equilibria um, have this characteristic that you disturb the system away from equilibrium. It, it tries to go back. To give you an example, of the, what, you know, what's the alternative? This, this, figure. This is an unstable equilibrium. If I get it just right, I can get zero net force. With the slightest disturbance, and it goes away and never comes back, the forces that show up push it the wrong way. So, so unstable equilibria are around also. Uh, they typically don't last long unless you deliberately uh, help fix them. And the, that's, it's harder with a short stick, but a longer stick. And we'll come back to this sort of thing. I can fix unstable equilibrium by doing this, right? I keep putting the, the bottom underneath the center of gravity of that stick. And, and I ran, yeah, <laughs> scare the people in the front row. Um, and so like you can fix unstable equilibrium sometimes, but stable equilibrium are, are easier to work with. And th so therefore, they're common in everyday situations. You, most, you mostly want stable equilibrium. Your car in stable equilibrium. People have, when they're on their feet properly, are in a, they're, they have a bit of stable equilibrium. You go a little too far, and it goes unstable, but it's there. Okay? So, at this point, what do, you, what do we have? We got, we got some, this springs, and their response to distortion. Uh, they, they go around a stable equilibrium. And I can show you, just, just to make sure it's, uh, you don't just take my word for it that springs behave this way. I can show you that springs have this characteristic that the farther you distort them, the harder they push back. And right now I have a, this gadget hanging on a spring. So there it is. So it's a very soft spring. The springs aren't deep. But if I, uh, and it's bouncing around in stable equilibrium, which is a, a whole nice story in itself. And I've, done a, I've talked about that to some extent earlier. Me get, it, get this guy to settle at its equilibrium. And now I can mark the equilibrium. These guys are dead, right? So there's the equilibrium position. And if I now put a weight on it, this is it's a 50 gram weight, so it's got a 50 gram object, so it has, if that's 0 0.05 kilograms, it will develop a force of 10, but about. 0.49 uh, newtons. And that the spring has to stretch in order to support that weight, that added downward pull. So now, having I've added 50 grams worth of weight, let me just call it that, and the thing is now settling at a lower, at a lower position, having stretched the spring enough to summon up 50 grams worth of restoring force. Okay? Any questions about that idea? Why it stretched? And, and now it's settled down again. So I can mark that. Here it is. And it's about, it stretched this spring about 9 units. I don't know if you can see that they're units. I can zoom in. If I do this, I will, I will forget. Zoom, let me, go, let me go up a little bit so you can see a little bit more here. We're getting seasick here. So now you can, you can see what's going on here. And I'm, I'm holding the pen here to remind me to undo what I just did with the camera because I forget. So the whole rest of the hour, and anybody watching the video later will go like, why am I staring at the scale? And now I'm going to I'm going to add an, a second identical object here. If I stay right, yes, of course. There we go. Ooh, settle down. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to help it settle. There it is, right around there. It stretched another nine-ish units. 
stretches in number nine unit. So you could use this as a scale. If I put some unknown thing on there and it stretches nine units, I know that it was a 50 gram thingy I put on, and it's carrying with it a weight of about half a newton. Uh, if I put something on there and it stretches only one unit, I know it's, it's got one ninth the weight of one of my little discs. So it's a scale. And that's what a scale is doing. Now I'm going to undo Come back here. Woo! We're back. Okay, so so what the scales are doing then, what this scale is doing is it probably has not a spring that's being stretched, but rather a spring that's being compressed. I mean, it's just a matter of choosing um, in the manufacturing process. But as the spring is stretched or compressed or whatever it's done, it turns the dial and it uses some sort of gearing system. We'll go to the rack and pinions to do that. But, but the basic idea is this dial is reporting how much the spring, spring is distorted. And they have calibrated the system, which is an adjustment they've done. They've chosen the spring carefully or they've chosen the gearing carefully so that, that as the spring descends, if it stretches this much, uh, it is now exerting a restoring force on my hand of 50 newtons. It's reading 50, and, and there, therefore it's been, a, it's been tweaked so that at this point it's pushing up on me with 50 newtons of force. And if I put then the, the weight on here, to support the weight of that guy, it takes 50 newtons of upward force, and it's telling us that it's spring distorted the right distance for it, for it. Uh, it's been, been uh, set up so that it's now pushing with 50 newtons at that given distortion. Can you follow the, the, the logical thread? Or any questions about that idea? Yeah. Seven centimeters, crack. Right. I've exceeded the elastic limit. Yeah. It, the reason I, is the reason why I have to put this, the the weight in the in the middle here. I mean, that's the center of gravity. Yeah. If I put the weight off on the side somewhere, it's going to produce torques along with the force. And I really want to measure just the pure gravitational force rather than these twisty effects. And so scales that are, are designed to, well, in fact, a lot of scales are designed to deal with off-center weight. But they, they work hard at it. For example, the, the electronic scales that you, that you often will stand on to measure yourself, uh, they typically have actually four separate scales, four separate springs, one in each corner. And they add up the support, the, 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 the force being exerted by all four springs. They do it digitally, and those springs are digital. They're electronic springs. They're, they're physically ordinary springs, but they but they report their distortion electronically. And then a little computer adds them up. Oh, this one's pushing this hard. This one's pushing that hard. This one's pushing that hard. It does work. So then it can handle off-center uh, weight. Is that okay? I mean, even even these guys, they have levers in them. This is the old-fashioned scale. They have levers in them to handle weight that's not on center, and, and therefore get or, or deal with the fact that you're twisting stuff as well as you're exerting force on it. Uh, where this thing goes, I don't know where it is. I get very, feel very often very boxed in by my my slides, which is why I often don't pay much attention to them. Uh, I'll remind you this question because you got it right last time, Jennifer Phillips. If 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 one person does. One one twin walks out onto a, onto a diving board, which is in fact a spring. It's a spring. It doesn't have any. Uh, there's no 
obvious reporting device to tell you how heavy the twin is, but its downward bend when it settles at equilibrium is proportional to the twin's weight. So if a second twin comes out and joins the first twin and they settle at equilibrium, the weight that the board is supporting is twice what it was before. And it's going to have to bend down twice what it did before in order to support that double weight. Is that okay? And so this is true of lots of things that are, as long as they're essentially one-dimensional devices, what's an alternative to one-dimensional device? A ball is not a spring. It doesn't obey Hooke's Law because it's got two dimensions, really. As you bend it, you dent it in, you're denting this surface. The surfaces are not two-dimensional. So it's messy. But one-dimensional things like a step, and this is where my questions, old exam questions, are go to a step class at the gym where you go on and off a plastic step. Well, that step is going to bend down and support your weight if you're standing still on it. I guarantee it's going to go down somewhat. Maybe not a lot, but a little bit. Here it goes. And a person who, if a person who weighs twice as much as you do comes along and replaces you on the step, it's going to bend down twice as far. So in principle, if you sneak up there with your ruler, you can figure out how heavy the people are. You can stand still on it. Now you can all be paranoid. What I wanted to go to was this. So that's how, so far I've talked about how a scale works. Take a spring. Stand or put the bag of carrots on the spring. Measure how far it's distorted downward. And then if someone has calibrated the scale, and is the word calibration, is the word calibration, gosh, the word calibration, what it means is it means to sort of, to adjust or compare to a reference. So if you know, for example, the spring I'm talking about with the carrots exerts one newton of force for every centimeter it gets squished. That's the calibration process. Somebody figured that out. Then you know if you put a sack of carrots on the scale and it bends downward 10 centimeters, there's a newton for every centimeter, it's 10 newtons. The carrots weigh 10 newtons. That's what it says. Okay? So that's, if you've got a spring and it is calibrated and you put stuff on it, you let it settle at equilibrium, and yet you look at how much the spring is distorted, you know how much the carrots weigh. What if the carrots decide to jump up and down? Not so good with carrots, but it's fine with people. This is where I told you a week or two or something ago that you guys are missing all the fun of life that comes with the old-fashioned scales that they're spring-based, just like modern scales are. However, they recorded immediately with a dial how much the spring had distorted. They didn't require... So now you're looking... You're looking at a dial of this old-fashioned scale. Years and years go by and I see more and more, which is like... So as the scale distorts downward, the dial turns. You're seeing the spring being bent and the dial is telling you how far it's bent in a calibrated way so that it reports the weight of the object sitting on it. Well, so what it's reporting is how hard it's pushing up. So if I stand on it and stand still, so it is reporting, you know, it's 194 or something, okay? And I'm motionless, which is important. So the net force on me is zero, and that means that it's pushing up on me with a force that exactly cancels my weight, and therefore, if it reports that it's pushing with 194 force, I'm evidently... Alas, that's what I weigh, okay? Well, what if I'm not standing still? Well, this is... I told you, like, when you're a kid and you only weigh 50 pounds, you can still do this. It is exerting a whole variety pack of forces on me, and it's correctly reporting them. And why aren't they equal to my weight? Because I'm not net force zero. I'm accelerating. I'm jumping up and down, okay? So if the carrots are jumping up and down on the scale, that's 
scale, it will read wacky. Um, you know, it's bad enough if you put your thumb on the scale. You know, the old-fashioned, the, the old butcher uh, selling you a cut of meat with their, with their thumb hanging on the, the scale uh, pushes the weight up. But if you drop the the, the, the cut of meat on the scale or, or a cut, cut of tofu to make it more politically saleable, drop the tofu on there during its impact on the scale. pushes up is enormous. Right? If something hits the scale, we did this before, right? I dropped a bowling ball or a water balloon on a table. Tremendous downward force. And if you a table pushes up a tremendous upward force. And if it's a scale, the scale, if you ask the scale, so how hard are you pushing? It'll go, that's 500 pounds of tofu. And it, it, that's what it'll report. In fact, what it's reporting is it's pushing up on this on this tofu with a force of 500 pounds to stop it. Some drilling a hole in the, in the counter. And is that okay? So, so if you want to do an accurate measurement of weight using a spring scale, the object you're weighing has to be uh, inertial, not accelerating. If it's accelerating, all bets are off. And so, fun and games here. I will. It's a little fun. Back up your microphone. Thanks. We'll have underwater sound for half the video. So right now, everything is not, not accelerating. And the, the scale is, is correctly reporting the weight of that little object as just under 10 newtons. It's a kilogram. It weighs just under 10 newtons. But if the, if the objects are accelerating, then weight and upward force on the weight aren't necessarily zero. In fact, they aren't. If it's truly accelerating, then they aren't. So if I bounce this guy, the spring scale is having fun. right? It's, it is correctly telling you how hard it's pulling on the weight. But there are times when it has to pull hard, times when it doesn't have to pull hard. If you average over time, interestingly, it'll average out properly to uh, 9.8. But at any given moment, up and down, and up and down. All right? So any questions about spring scales themselves? Yeah. The, 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 this funny reading is because gravity is pulling harder on the, blo on the block? Is that, is that the question? Actually, no. How hard is, the, is gravity pulling on that block? 9.8 the whole time. What's ha what the problem here is that, that as it hits the bottom of the bounce, let's just pick one moment in time, the bottom of the bounce, is the net force on it zero? No, because it's accelerating upward toward equilibrium. It's trying. It's been heading down all this time, and we're bringing it to a stop and, and, and going to start taking it upward. And that requires an upward net force to, to accelerate it from, from a downward motion to upward motion. And so at the bottom of the bounce, it's being pulled up extra hard. And it's telling you that. Take a look. Every time it gets to the bottom, it's reading the highest it ever reads. Does that make sense? The opposite is true at the top. At the top of the bounce, is the, the, the object is going from having been hitting upward to heading downward. It's accelerating downward. Again, back towards the equilibrium, actually. And so for it to accelerate downward, it needs a downward net force. It needs gravity to actually be bigger than the upward pull from the spring. So the, the net force is downward. And the, the spring correctly reads that it's, that it's, that it's uh, pulling up extra weakly on the top. At the top of the bounce, it's, that's the lowest of the force ever gets. Is that OK with everybody? Right in the middle, at this point, at what is known as at, at the true equilibrium right here, it's reading 9.8 right now when it's motionless. It will also read 9.8 when it's bouncing, but at that location. Watch. Let's get it bouncing. Every time it hits equilibrium, which is, you know, it's, which is right about it's hard to point it out. But when it gets there, it's, the, the needle is right at 9.8, but moving. It's sweeping through. It sweeps through equilibrium just as the, as the mass coasts through equilibrium. It doesn't stop there, but it, but it momentarily is there. 
Is that okay? And this, this actually, I'm going to edit the scale out of the story because this just complicates life. But this then, it, I can sort of look at the whole bouncing motion, which is really one of the most important, this kind of motion is one of the most important motions in, 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 in nature. It shows up in so many contexts. Um, in fact, this is the, not, not only is this motion important, but this version of it, a mass on a spring, is the sort of the prototypical source of this kind of motion. This system has an equilibrium, that is a, a, a position which is experiencing no overall force. It's right here. And the reason I know it's right here is because if I settle this guy there, it doesn't accelerate. So the, there no, there's no overall, oh, blah, blah, no overall force on it. If I take it away from equilibrium and let go, though, it bounces around the equilibrium. It's a stable equilibrium. Remember I talked about stable equilibrium? This guy, it always goes back towards there. And if you, so you store it, it wants to go back. So this is a stable equilibrium. It, it actually has, this thing can do, do more than one motion, and you're, and you're seeing it. It, it, it has the ability to swing as well as to, as to bounce. And it's interestingly transferring energy from one of those motions to the other. Can you see that it's swinging now? And that in a few moments, it won't be swinging. It's all bouncing. And then it will go back to swinging. It's transferring the energy back and forth between two possible motions. This is, this is a side effect. It almost always shows up in systems like this, um, if I'm not careful. But this rhythmic movement of energy from one motion to another, where the two motions have very similar um, time characteristics. It's, it, this is called resonant energy transfer. This motion, bounce, 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 bounce. And this motion, swing, 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 swing. It's an, they're, they're evidently related. And you get energy transfer from one to the other. Um, a context which is familiar is when when some music is playing on your sound system and, and something starts buzzing across the room, there's energy transfer from the one to the other in sort of this kind of mechanism. Yeah, now, it's, now it's doing the, the back and forth again. All right, but that wasn't what I wanted to teach you about. What I want to teach you about is this motion, the bounce motion. We've already seen that the, at the top and bottom of the bounce, the spring is most pulled away from the equilibrium, and therefore it pushes the hardest. And so the, the force and therefore the acceleration is worst at the end of the bounce, ends of the bounce, the top and the bottom. That's true vertically here. If I could do this horizontally, you'd see the same thing. Here's a horizontal version of it. Um, yeah. Right? It's, there's the equilibrium, and it's going back and forth around the equilibrium. The acceleration is the strongest at this extreme and that extreme. That's when the spring is bent the most, and therefore is pushing the hardest. So the peak, the peak accelerations are at the ends. The fastest motion, however, that is the peak velocity, is right at equilibrium, the, it, the other possibility. So the ends, the, the stick is motionless, the spring in this case. The spring is motionless at the ends. It's just at the end about to turn back. Just at the end about to turn back. So it's, the maximum acceleration occurs at the ends when it's motionless. And the maximum velocity, or speed, in any direction, is at the middle. Because up until the moment when it reaches the middle on its, this motion, it has been accelerating forward in the direction it's moving. It hits equilibrium, and then the acceleration turns around and slows it down. So it reaches peak speed as it, as it rushes towards equilibrium going faster and faster. It goes through equilibrium and then goes slower and slower and slower, turns around, it comes back faster and faster and faster, coasts through equilibrium and then slows down. So maximum velocities are the greatest speeds. At the center, least speed at the ends. Greatest acceleration at the ends, no acceleration in the middle. Right at equilibrium, no acceleration at all, no force. Is that OK? Uh, if you want to see places where the bounce, this kind of bouncing motion shows up that matter, I mean, apart from just these fun and games, uh, watch a pendulum clock. You know, go, go visit Monticello and watch Jefferson's clock tick back and forth. That pendulum 
is swinging back and forth about its stable equilibrium, which is directly down. And you take it the farthest away, that's peak acceleration. When it goes through the middle, peak velocity. It goes to the other side, peak acceleration back. Middle, peak velocity, back and forth, all day. All right? Last thing to talk about with the, this bouncing motion. So, so spring scales along with being the story of, of how you weigh stuff using spring scale, but also the, my, my introduction to this bouncing motion, which, which we'll, we'll revisit, assuming I keep everything on pace decently, in the context of clocks, in the context of musical instruments. Virtually all musical instruments ba are based on these motions. Guitar uh, strings going back and forth, um, a, a flute, you know, where's the sound of the flute? It's the air bouncing back and forth inside that pipe. Uh, a drum, it's, it's a surface going up and down. It's a little more complicated because it is a surface. It's not a one-dimensional simple system. But uh, so this motion is, is really, has a big effect on your life, whether you notice it or not. And the other issue that comes then is, is sort of how long does it last and why does it last anyway? Why does it keep going? And it, that's an energy issue. That if it's sitting here at equilibrium, it can't get started moving because it hasn't got enough energy to do anything, to get, to get going. I have to invest energy to start the motion. And how do, I do, how do I invest the energy? I do work on it. So I, for example, I'll push up on, the, on the, the object, and it'll move up. I'm doing work. I invest the energy into it, and I let go. There it goes. So you put energy in, and now you get the motion back and forth. And as it's going back and forth, and I wish it weren't bouncing at the same time it's swinging as the same time it's bouncing, because I can get one that doesn't do that. Try to change the spring. Yeah, maybe I'll, we'll see whether this one. So now it's going back. The energy is, is, is shifting back and forth between, it's still going to go into, it's, it wants to do this, these swinging motions. The energy is going back and forth in energy that, that's stored temporarily in the distortion of the spring. And because this is vertical, it also ends up in gravitational potential energy. Um, the fact that there are two forms of potential energy just makes the story a little complicated, but not, it's not inherently interesting. Basically, the energy is going back and forth between a stored form when it's the, at the top or bottom and is almost motionless, and a, a kinetic form when it's moving fastest in the middle. So the energy is going back and forth between, you know, it's, it, this is, the motion is too fast for me to call it off. A slower motion, back in a second. I'm coming back, be good. Hey, bowling ball. <laughs> Slower motion where, where I can call it off, and I, I've done it before. You've heard me do this, so I'll do it anyway. Um, there we go. That's equilibrium, right? No, no energy. I invest energy by doing work on it. I'm pushing, it's moving in the direction I push, energy's in, and now it can do this motion. And the energy's going from purely gravitational right now to kinetic, to gravitational, kinetic, gravitational. And you can see that it's motionless at the ends. So those are the moments of maximum acceleration, no velocity. And the, here in the middle is maximum velocity, no acceleration. Okay? It's a little complicated because it's an arc. Acceleration is a little messy, but it's pretty clean. And this will keep going until somebody steals its energy. I can steal the energy by doing negative work on it. Gone, right? I, I stopped it. The other thing is, is the air can, can do negative work on it. Every time it's going this way, the air is pushing it backwards, doing negative work on it. The air is pushing it backwards, doing negative work on it. Negative work on it. Negative work on it. It will gradually suck the energy out of it, but it will take the rest of the, of the hour to, to finish the job. And so these kind of bouncing or oscillatory motions continue until you run out of energy. And depending on the situation, 
You might want the, the energy to disappear quickly or slowly. You want it to disappear quickly if you're weighing something. If you're, weigh, if you're weighing something and you initially put the weight on and let go, the bouncing motion happens. You can't avoid it, or it's very hard to avoid it. Um, you, so it bounces, but this thing is designed to waste the energy as quickly as it can without damaging the accuracy of, of the scale itself. I mean, you can take the energy out especially quickly by just basically putting tremendous friction in the whole system. Just fill it with sand, the whole mechanism with sand. The problem is that it will ruin the accuracy of the scale because the sand itself will begin to in introduce forces and the scale might read, you know, if I play sand here, I can make it read anything I want, right? Because I'm mucking up the, the, the scale's ability to move. So you got to be gentle with it. Uh, that's a case where you want what, what, what you, what, what's called damping. You want to damp out the oscillation as quickly as you can. Another case, you want it to go as, uh, as little damping as possible. If you're trying to keep time, and this motion, like in many of these motions, are very good at keeping time, at ticking off intervals of time very consistently. But they do that best when the damping is tiny, when the swing is so nearly perfect that it, it will keep going essentially forever. So those are the two extremes. But you'll, you'll find um, a, a random examples. Your car sits atop the wheels supported on springs. It's not literally coupled directly to the wheels. If it were and you drove over a speed bump, bam, it would just drive your head right into the you know, in your neck, you would be the world's shortest person. So um, the car instead sits on springs which sit on the chassis with the wheels. And when the wheels go jump over that speed bump, springs compress. And you then gently are pushed up and down. But it, but that, so springs are great for the suspension of a car, but they have a drawback. If you start to bounce down the road after hitting some bump, the right kind of bump will get this going, and you bounce, you're driving along like this. And the forces involved vary up and down, as we've seen already. And there are times when the bumps enough, if the bounce is strong enough, where you're barely touching the road. So you have what are called shock absorbers. You know, if you ever wonder, what the heck is a shock absorber doing? Its purpose in life is not to give you a cushy ride. It's to damp out the bouncing that inevitably follows the spring, spring suspensions. And when the shock absorber fails, it's not that your ride becomes hard all of a sudden and you, you feel the bumps, but rather that you're driving like this. So if your car is doing this down the road after you go over a pothole, it's time to replace your shock absorbers because they're not effectively getting rid of the extra energy to allow the thing to settle at equilibrium. Okay? With that, we'll call it a day and see you on Monday.